This is a production of Cornell University. Well, it, it is my sad pleasure to talk on the late Tom Taylor, one of the preeminent paleobotanists of our time, and to kind of celebrate Tom and Tom's contributions to the discipline over time. Those of you who have been in the field for a little while, like Fran, <laughs> will know all of the history of this. But students coming in, uh, I think it's helpful for students to see what people can do, what people can become, and what kind of contributions people can make. And so I, can, I don't know of a better example for any of us than Tom Taylor to emulate. If you can aspire to the success and contributions of Tom Taylor and fail by getting 20% of it done, you will be a roaring success in the discipline. So this is to Tom who died on the uh, April 28th at the age of 78. Now, as, as a bit of a background, Tom Taylor's an Ohio boy who went to Miami University, graduating in 1960, and then he went on to the University of Illinois uh, to work with Wilson Stewart. At that time, the vast majority of paleobotany that was being practiced was coal-ball paleobotany. The tropical wetlands of primarily Pennsylvanian age. And Wilson Stewart was one of the leading, ran one of the leading labs in that area. Um, and when Tom, this is Tom, this is high school graduation picture, so you can see what he looked like at the time. Uh, <coughs> He then, went, after completing his PhD, he went on to Yale University and worked with Ted DeLavorius, who became a lifelong friend and, and confidant of Tom's. And immediately after finishing his postdoc, he was hired at the University of Illinois at Chicago Circle, where he uh, arrived in 1965 as an assistant professor he was promoted to full professor before leaving in 1972, and he took his first graduate students in 1967 when the graduate program opened up at the University of Illinois at Chicago Circle. Then in 1972, he went to Ohio University, was there for two years, and, and then he went on to Ohio State University to chair the Department of Botany there. And after 21 years there, he retired. Well, he retired from Ohio State University, and he went, he uh, accepted a uh, endowed chair at the University of Kansas, where he went as chair of the department, and where he has been active uh, ever since. He also had some significant um, visiting professorships, working with Ted Delavorius in 1978, setting up the International Organization of Paleobotany Conference that was at uh, University of Alberta in 1984, and then moving on to Munster, where he became heavily involved with Riney Chert, and particularly the uh, fungal uh, biotas associated with that. Uh, here's Tom with his mother. Tom was more than a paleobotanist, he was a person. And he was a guy that uh, a lot of us thought very highly of. Uh, here's there are two kinds of slides here. They're the ones on the black background that I've made up in the last two or three days, and then there are these that are very artsy that Ruth did uh, for a program two or three years ago. So here she celebrates his mentor, Wilson Stewart. Uh, here's some early field work. Uh, and, and this will be a coal mine in southern Illinois. Here's Wilson Stewart. Here's Tom. Uh, here's another one of the same era. Here's Tom. Here's Don Agert, who Tom worked with it very closely for many years, and Dave Dilcher. Now, 
Tom's career is uh, a, a fantastic example of research productivity, research breadth, research innovation, and rigor. High, very high standards of quality in his research. Uh, he published 468 peer-reviewed papers. This is a goal, isn't it? You on your way, Kelly? Yeah. And in peer-reviewed journals and edited volumes. Uh, he published three editions of his very famous and popular paleobotany textbook. Here's the last edition of that. He published the first paleomycology textbook, which just came out in the last few months here. And to follow the progression of Tom's research, we see that he began working on morphology and anatomy of cobalt plants. As a graduate student, he, worked, he then was very interested in little things. He became very enamored of and worked on pollen and spores, which brought him to electron microscopy. He brought the first scanning electron microscope in the city of Chicago into the University of Illinois. And we had it in the lab there when, no, when medical schools had to come and use the equipment. Uh, so, and he developed uh, scanning electron microscopy techniques that are used in paleobotany today. He also uh, used transmission electron microscopy and some of his students were trained in that realm. Uh, later on, he became interested in fossil fungi, which we knew very little about, and which was very reasonable because paleobotanists were vascular plant people. And fungi you find in anatomical sections and preparations. And paleobotanists always want to have the nicest anatomy. And of course, the fungi uh, you find in the crappiest anatomy because they've been working on it. So uh, although their fungi were extremely um, abundant, we didn't look at them because we didn't know what to look for until Tom got into it. Uh, he, that brought him into organismal interactions uh, through time, and uh, his last major uh, conquest was Antarctic paleobotany, working on Permian, Triassic, and Jurassic biotas, some uh, anatomically preserved from the church and some compression fossils. Uh, here's some early in-the-field shots collecting cobalts in the Sahara Number 6 mine in southern Illinois. Here's a shovel here. It's about the, that's a, about the size of a three-story house, and here we are like little ants. Uh, the shovel's actually about 100 yards beyond where we are collecting there. And uh, we collected them in the pits. Um, Tom worked on the genus Pachytesta, the medullosins, for his doctoral dissertation. Um, and after collecting these things and bagging them up, we would fill up U-Haul trucks with them, and then we'd be extremely tired at the end of the day. We'd just kill ourselves doing that stuff. And so there were, I think, 6,000 cold balls that were cut, cataloged, and the plants identified and cross-referenced at the University of Illinois, Chicago Circle. Tom was a... a, a outstanding mentor of students. So in addition to scholarship, we have mentorship. He, he took his first master's students in 1967, uh, and there's a list of the people who had master's degrees with him. He turned out doctoral students from 1975 right on up to 2015. And you see a large number of names of people here you know and people who have gone on to be productive scholars in the field. Here are some pictures that Ruth put together for his 75th birthday celebration of the former students. I'm not going to be able to go through all of these because uh, of the time, but uh, this is going to go up on the web so anybody who's interested can actually read all the names here. I'll point out a few. These are early graduate students. Uh, Jim Mickle, there's Ruth, uh, and there's Edie. There's Mike Millay down here. 
and there's, of course, Tom working hard in the field. Uh, his, his teaching went on all the time. And uh, this is, this is uh, a field trip to uh, Arkansas, working on Mississippi and stuff, with Don Agert and, and his compatriot with his tongue out here, and then Sheila Brack here. Um, and here he is teaching in the field. Here are more students from his Ohio State days with uh, Kathleen Pig and Charlie Good, Sarah Stubblefield, who did a lot of the early mycology work with Tom. Um, there's Ruth again. Here is Mike Cheen, who was tragically killed in an air crash, coming back from the meetings. Uh, it was the plane that crashed in uh, Detroit, in the city. Uh, more students. Chuck Dolly in with Ruth. There's Patty. I won't go into, won't name them all because of time. Uh, I will point out one one person here though. Here is uh, Michael Kring. It's the only picture I have of any of his German connections. So there's Michael, who he's worked with very extensively in the last few years. In the mentorship continued on to postdocs. Tom had a few postdocs during his time, and I'm not going to talk about any of them individually, but I will point out that the postdocs extend from 1975 to 2015, from around the world. A large number of very productive scholars today um, are on this list. He also had very wide collaboration, so in addition to scholarship and mentorship, collaboration with colleagues is something that he did very well. And these are a list of not all of his collaborators. These are the visiting scientists that he hosted in his lab over the years. And uh, this, these include uh, our colleagues from around the world and many very prominent names as well. Now, along the way, he built a lot of really uh, strong friendships. Uh, Ted Delavorius has been a very close friend of his over the years. Uh, this is um, Mike Bolter from England and uh, Barry Thomas from Wales. And here is, uh, this is Bill Challoner from England. In the early 1980s, Tom began to work with Argentine paleobotanists. Uh, this is uh, Sergio Arkangelsky, Papa, the patriarch of paleobotany in Argentina. And he began working with uh, Sergio and his students, which has brought together uh, a lifelong collaboration and little kids like this came into it along the way. Here's Tom on a collecting trip, back of a truck in Patagonia. Argentinians know how to have a good time. We do. So, here's Ruben Cunio, who was here last week. And uh, here's Nacho Escapa, who spent, what, a year here, a couple years ago? Six months? Six months? Six months here, a couple years ago, yeah. This is uh, an asado that we had when I was out in the field with them four or five years ago. Here's an early one from 1985. Uh, there is uh, Papa, um, there's Tom, and there's Edie. I don't know the other people in that photo. I do. You do? <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure you would. <laughs> okay. And. Uh, so Tom went back and forth between first uh, Ohio State and then from Kansas to Argentina. Here he is in the petrified forest. Uh, he actually started on work from this when he put Ruth Stocky on her master's and doctoral dissertation on cones from the petrified forest. And 
I don't have time to tell you about her never being there because she got deported from Argentina. But, uh, and then there was the German collaborations. And I, I'm afraid I don't have pictures of the German collaborators because I'm in the midst of moving from Ohio to Oregon and everything is packed. And so in the two or three days I had to put this together, I was unable to get pictures. But uh, he went over there first uh, uh, on an Alexander von Humboldt Senior Research Award uh, from 1994 through and again in 1996, actually. Um, and he worked on Rhiney Chert uh, that Winifred Remy had been working on. And he worked actually some with Remy, but more with Hans Kerp and his technician who, and collaborate Hogg and Haas, and most recently with Michael Krings, who he's worked with very extensively recently and is a co-author on the, the Fossil Fungi book. So that's been an extremely um, important collaboration, both for paleomycology and for biological interactions through time. And finally, the last thing that Tom has done which has made a really major impact is Antarctic paleobotany of the Permian Triassic and more recently up into the Jurassic where there's really good stuff that's starting to come out of there now. So here's Tom uh, uh, dressed for the, the Hilo. Now to put this in perspective, the uh, James Morton shop or old Jim shop who was one of our paleobotanical patriarchs in the 1960s, was at the U.S. Geological Survey Cold Geology Lab in Orton Hall on the Ohio State University campus, across the campus from Tom when he was there. And Jim was working on Antarctic fossils in the 60s and, and into the 70s. And when he died in the late 70s, his Tom picked up the material looked it over and realized that there was just a huge amount of work that to be done with it. Schopp had just barely scratched the surface. So he picked up the mantle from Schopp at that time and extended it into Permian Triassic and Jurassic Churts and compression floras that we've seen so much of over the last few years with Tom and his students and his postdocs and his collaborators. Um, so here's some pictures from Antarctica. This is a great picture of Tom looking content. Uh, here's some of the people he worked with, John Isabel and Ruben Cunio. Uh, oops. This will be Isabel and, and this will be Ruben in somewhat younger days. Uh, this is the first Antarctic trip that Tom took, where he went with Edie and, and Ruth. Um, of course, Tom's easy to pick out here. Uh, this one's Ruth. And they were uh, not only collecting, but they were doing things like, you know, they're building an igloo, because when you went down there at that time, you had to do survival training, and so you had to build yourself a shelter and stay in it overnight. And since, well, overnight, even though there's no dark light all the time. Uh, here they are, the penguin rookery, with the penguins. Uh, here's Ruth working from a snowmobile, a, a snowmobile or a skidoo, and Edie there. And then here we are packing up fossils. I didn't go with them on the first trip, but I went with them a couple of times later. And uh, more shots of life when you're camping out in Antarctica and collecting. And this is the source of the material. It gets collected, it gets boxed up in crates, gets put on the ship, shipped back, and arrives several months after you get back. The, uh, one of the biggest camps they have is at Beardmore Glacier, and here's the 1976 or 1986 crew at Beardmore Glacier. Here's some of my favorite pictures from there. I always thought that uh, this was uh, Tom being serious about having people collect. And, uh, and here is the, his 
certificate of um, completing the Snowcraft and Survivor School in uh, 1985. And you can see how much he's enjoying himself in that environment there. Another area where Tom was extremely influential is in building our discipline. Tom has been an, ex an extremely important builder of paleobotany at the national and international levels. He was very important in building the International Organization of Paleobotany, where he was president at one time. In 1984, he went to the University of Alberta for six months, and he and Ruth organized the second International Organization of Paleobotany Conference, the University of Alberta, and had a spectacular field trips there. Um, these are shots of a Paleocene locality, and here's how they made the fossils available to people. They ran in there with the, the bulldozer and cut shelves back so that people could just go ahead and collect the fossils. And spectacular collecting. Um, they also had a champagne and watermelon uh, at the end of the collecting trip. Uh, Tom always did everything with class. Uh, they went to the uh, lots of places in the Canadian Rockies while they were there. Uh, here he is with Ted. And here are some Japanese graduate students on the Athabasca Glacier where there are pools of water and they would stick their hand down in the water and uh, time them to see who was the toughest and keep, could keep it in there the longest. Uh, Tom had a lot of family in terms of scholastic family and friends. A lot of people with whom he is very close and influenced uh, extensively. He worked very closely with, with uh, Don Eggert for many years. They were together at the University of Illinois at Chicago Circle in the late 60s um, and early 70s. And at that time, it was probably the most active paleobotany lab in the world. They had a dozen graduate students going and here are some of, the, of this crew, uh, including, here's Ted. Uh, that's uh, Mike. The other side? That guy? I don't know. He's, he washed out. <laughs> here's Eric Carfalt and Marion Wilson. Uh, here's Ruth and Edie. That, I'm not sure. That could be Cookie Trivet. There's um, <sighs> Marie. Marie, thank you. Every Murray Kerman. Yeah. I was at a meeting around 1970, maybe, something like that. I was looking for a picture that was old enough for Bill not to have white hair, but I couldn't find one. Yeah. <laughs> so here, here's, uh, fortunately, uh, for, we were able to have a celebration of, for Tom when he turned 75. And uh, in, in 2012, and we had a celebration of that at the Paleobotanical Banquet at the Botanical Society meetings, and then later in, in September that year at the uh, IOPC, we had a symposium dedicated to him. And from that came a special issue of the International Journal of Plant Science. We had, oh, I've forgotten, 24, 25 papers by uh, almost 50 authors, uh, all of whom had been very closely associated with Tom as students, former students, students of former students, postdocs, former postdocs, uh, close collaborators, and people he worked with in building the International Organization of Paleobotany. So we were delighted to be able to honor him with that. Uh, in the Thomas N. Taylor Diamond Jubilee special issue of the International Journal of Plant Sciences that came out in 2013. Now the last thing I want to talk about is Tom as a poet. You don't think of Tom as a poet, but his students do. Uh, and, it, and it brings out some of Tom uh, in a more personal sense, the types of things which have made endeared his students to him and him to his students. 
he would write poems for his students and leave them on their desk. Now fortunately I cleared out of the lab before he discovered he could do that. And he often did that with uh, when somebody had done something that was a bit embarrassing, either that or somebody had done something that was uh, really outstanding. This is uh, Charlie Good at the time, and I'll, I'll read the beginning of this. Uh, there once was an employee named Good who worked with fossils as best he could. His talents and drive were better than most. He even was known to occasionally boast. That's a little dig at him there. And then I'll just skip down to the bottom. A moral I have none to relate to this chap, but there he, but were he now hear me through, thunder would clap. And probably an echo would be whispered for sure. Your dear friend and colleague, an occasional butcher. <laughs> Charlie had screwed something up, and he left a note on his desk. Uh, I'm not going to read all of these. Here's one that uh, was that he wrote for Edie when she was his student, where she had, uh, I think, done a misidentification, which he brought to her attention with this poem. Uh, Here's one for uh, Lisa Boucher. Here's one for Jeff Osborne. And here's a real long one for Marie Kerman. And since these are going to go up, I'm not going to bother to, I'm not going to read them because I don't have the time. But over the years, Ruth was complaining that he never wrote a poem for her. And so at the Ruth Rose that we had when she retired at the University of Alberta that was held last year, he wrote a poem for her and he read it. And I, I think I'm gonna, I will play that for you. There once was a last name Stocky. All my poems begin there once was. <laughs> there once was a last name Stocky whose climb to the top was always rocky. <laughs> she labored away night and day, searching for perfection, some did say. For a reason that is still far from clear, this last stocky was sometimes heard to cheer. I love pines, <laughs> aracarians, and even you. I'm a gymnosperm gal through and through. <laughs> Give me stomata with sunken guard cells. <laughs> These hold climate secrets that are known to cast spells. <laughs> A place in the sun where all will know. I was the first to describe them, and not just for show. Her research was solid and easy to share. She got funded to travel here and there do comparative studies with much to say gymnosperms are great but now past their heyday <laughs> what will i do for the years to come maybe teach students that are far too dumb <laughs> haploid diploid saurus and spores Ferns might be fun, but the researchers are bores. <laughs> <laughs> By now she had traveled some distance away, where the winters are cold and the snow is all play, to a land where all cars continue to stall, but it's also the home of the Edmonton Mall. <laughs> Now entered a wise man named Stewart who said, Ruthie, my dear, you won't need a sled to visit a site I know very well where the summers are great and the winters are hell. <laughs> the floor, floor of there screams, visit our grave. We'll show you stuff that will make even Rockwell rave. <laughs> Many hold secrets that some will scorn but we were around here before even you were born. <laughs> Flowers abound. They're all over the place with periant parts in your face. Some grew in waters. Others got dry land. 
Princeton's our name, so give us a hand. We'll set you off to publish more stuff with your students and colleagues, some in a huff. Just think about the data we humbly hold, new hypotheses for paleobotany that can be easily sold. And so she went to Princeton, not Yale. <laughs> <laughs> Collecting megatons and rock and even some shale. <laughs> Slabbing the stuff and looking for plants, some even with fungi in their pants. <laughs> Her bio got longer, her curiosity stronger. I love this said, stuff she said to all. The Eocene is great, it's even a ball. And then one day a new friend would say, there's a place that I call the Appian Way. <laughs> Petrified stuff all over the place, nodules and rocks, some even in place. And so it went for this site too, papers and talks, more research to do. Is this getting too long? <laughs> In reading this poem to a mate one night, whose eyes rolled up and then out of sight, <laughs> stop it, Tom, I can take no more. Your colleagues will think you're a terrible bore. <laughs> After crying out loud, this shameless poet did say, I've given to Ruth her special day, a verse for her that is long overdue. If you don't like the rhymes here, then screw all of you. <laughs> so with that in mind, when Tom became really ill in the last month, Ruth wrote a poem for him. And I'll try not to screw it up too badly. Uh, a poem for Tom Taylor by Ruth Stocky. There once was a botanist named Taylor who said that I talked like a sailor. Mentor and friend, no horse's rear end, a prince of a fellow, Tom Taylor. His microscopy type was scanning, flames of palynology, then he was fanning. Pollen and spores, no study for bores, carboniferous coal balls in planning. His partner in crime was named Donald, a guy with no need to be coddled. They blew up the truck with a little bad luck, falling rocks was the story they modeled. A fern they named Tedelia, with fern characteristics so curia. Named for Delavorius, the name was just glorious, but Norwidia, oh my, oh Deus. Tom perfected the method of peeling. Ground packy testa with verb and with feeling. Carboniferous seeds fulfilled all his needs, but in time needed work more appealing. Left Chicago for Athens, Ohio, an additional notch on his bio. Start of interest in fungi, we all know this fun guy, was a scientist there for tomorrow. Calamites, radstockia, and seed ferns, bomonites, saccate pollen, and we learned. He said that ontogeny recapitulates phylogeny toward reproductive biology, he turned. He moved on to Columbus, Ohio to be chairman, Department of Bio. The dandelion bloomed and insurrection loomed, but he triumphed in time, meo mio. His students, uh, the line should be towing, darkroom whining on time spent is growing, help with foot fatigue, called those, these workers Bush League, rubber matting, the solution now showing. His wisdom for his students legendary. In this lab, no need to st stall or ever tarry. Get your pubs drafted or else you'll get shafted. Good job, good, now good jobs are what's customary. In my lab, you'll get a PhD in moving. It's coal balls from the strata we're removing. Publish or perish the mantra we cherish. It's hypothesis we should be proving. All his students at the uni so productive studied gymnosperms, horsetails, and firms reproductive. It's time for cathartic 
will collect the Antarctic. Glossopter sure sounds seductive. Beardmore Glacier Laboratory students added to the story. Fossil plant explanatory working on their oratory. Came, um, cambium and fossil phloem, some of them deserved a poem. All of their work is laudatory, added greatly to his glory. Many reconstructions of whole plants even gave us time to work on grants. Ferns and fungi from Triassic Developmental Studies Classic Paleobotany Rants. From fossil plants, from the chert known as Rhiney, with fungi included so tiny, studied with Hagen Haas and others with Klaas, with life cycles that uh, formally stymie. The Permian studies of tree rings, conifers, cuticles, and like things, lichens and assai, the studies were classy bacteria with Mikkel Krings. Pennsylvanian leaf, epiphyte fungi were described by this famous once buckeye. Cones of the cycad, spores found in dyads were papers with his old alumni. His paleo books have been well received, even better than we all believed. Biology and evolution was his great contribution, each particularly well achieved. What will be his future goals? Will he study petioles? Will he macerate some coals? Will he have new founded roles? Must stay away from all assholes. We who have benefited from his instruction, succumb to paleobotanical seduction, learn the powers of botanical deduction, practice whole plant reconstruction, try to emanate his production. So there is Ruth recapitulating Tom's career and his uh, effect on his students and colleagues. Here are a list of awards and honors. I will point out that he, his awards include Distinguished Scholar, Distinguished Teaching Awards. Here's his National Academy of Science selection, amongst the others. And so, as a, an example of what one can be, and what we all wish that we were, and what students still can be, so long, Tom, we miss you. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.